Good morning, Community Alliance Church. We are so glad that you are here worshiping with us this morning. Now, normally we start in musical worship, and that's what we're going to do in just a few minutes, but I want to encourage you to think about musical worship a little bit differently this morning. Now, when we go on a typical Sunday morning and we're all gathered together as part of one church in one location, the way that we worship is limited to us singing. But with all of us being separate in our own individual houses, this is actually an opportunity for you to have some freedom in how you choose to worship God. I know in our household with two small children running around, worship is a lot more chaotic than it normally would be. But we actually take advantage of this. We get out some tambourines, we get out some sticks, and there's a lot of noise going on and some dancing going on as we are doing worship together. So take this as an opportunity. Maybe you can pick up a guitar, maybe you can pick up a drum, but worship God as he is calling you to worship him this morning. One, two, one, two, three, four.
the children to listen to our children's message. Good morning, kids. Today we're going to hear the story all about when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well. Well, Jesus and his disciples were on their way back to Galilee from Judea, and the disciples were really saddened that there were going to be no pyrotechnics today. But at least the administrative board knew that the pastor wasn't going to burn down the church. But on his way, he had to pass through a region called Samaria. And the people who lived there were not liked very much by the Jews. Well, while they were on their way, they stopped at a village to get some food. Jesus' disciples went into town while Jesus rested by the well. As he was resting there, a woman came up to the well to get some water. So Jesus asked her if he could get some water from her. Now she was very surprised by this, because it was not normal for someone like Jesus to talk with a woman like her. After all, the Jews didn't get along very well with the Samaritans. So she questioned Jesus about this. But Jesus told her that if she only knew who she was talking to, she would be asking him for water because the water he could provide would give her eternal life. Well, the woman wasn't sure what to think about this. But then Jesus told her some things about her life that only he could have known if he was a prophet. So when she heard this, she knew that that must be the case. And in fact, she soon realized that he was actually the Messiah. So she left her water jar behind and went to tell everyone she knew from the town all about Jesus. Well, as she went, the disciples were returning with some food. But Jesus told them that he already had some food that they didn't know anything about. Well, the disciples were confused by this. But Jesus explained that his food was to do his father's work. 
and he told his disciples to look at the crowd of approaching Samaritans. He told his disciples that sharing the gospel with the Samaritans was part of this work. So Jesus and the disciples stayed with the Samaritans for two days. And through the words of the woman that Jesus had met at the well, as well as all the Samaritans' conversations with Jesus, many of them came to believe that Jesus was indeed the Savior of the world. And that's the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. Thanks for joining us, kids! Please join me as we pray for these children this morning. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this day that we can spend together, even though we are in our own individual locations. And we thank you for these kids, that they are here participating in worship with us. And God, as they are going throughout their day today, as they are listening to their lesson, I pray that you would bless them, encourage them, guide them towards yourself, Lord. And most importantly, we pray that you'd bring them to know you at a very young age. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Community Alliance Church and YouTube. You are hanging in there. You are hanging in there. If you're watching this video, you are hanging into Christ and you're persevering. And I just want to say praise God for that. So a couple announcements. Number one, we've got communion next Sunday. So have your elements ready. Number two, we did another parade and we visited people and we yeah. cheered and I want you to hear all about that and we're going to be talking about that today on our Ooh. fellowship hour which is 12 to 1 on YouTube right, on our yeah. YouTube channel you can tune in after it's recorded or you can tune in while it's live from 12 to 1 we're also going to be hearing from uh, Pastor Jack during that time and I know he's going to be dropping some awesome wisdom for us and so we can't wait to hear from him so tune in 12 to 1 fellowship hour YouTube yeah. channel see you then bye in a few moments, we're going to pray over the offering together. So if you need to pause the video and take a few moments to write a check or give online, please do so, and then we will pray together. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your generosity and all that you have given to us. And this morning, as we are giving back to you what is truly yours to begin with, Lord, we just pray that these things will be used to advance your kingdom in this place and give you glory that people would come to know you as they have not known you before. And Lord, as we are looking to the message this morning and looking to learn more about you and, and walk in your ways, God, I pray that this message this morning, these words that are coming from you, from your scripture, would penetrate our hearts, would change our lives, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading for this morning is from John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, going all the way through to verse 42. So if you can have one or more members from your household read that scripture aloud, you can pause the video for a moment, and then when you are finished, you can return to me. So we pick up reading this morning, starting in John verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now, last week we were talking about how Jesus and his disciples were baptizing in a region near John the Baptist, and how John the Baptist's disciples were starting to become a little bit envious of the success of Jesus' ministry. And that success had actually made it all the way back to the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees were already ticked off at Jesus because Jesus had done that whole cleansing of the temple thing back in Jerusalem. And because of the success of Jesus' ministry was starting to get so annoying to the Pharisees, once Jesus discovered that the Pharisees knew about his baptisms in this area, he found it necessary to leave the region entirely and go back to Galilee. Now Galilee is north of Judea. And the last time we talked about Jesus being in Galilee was when he was at the wedding in Cana. So Jesus was going to go to Galilee. But the quickest way to get there would involve him going through the region of Samaria, which was actually sandwiched between the two. To give a brief history lesson here, which will be important for our later discussions, back in the time of the Old Testament, during the reign of King Solomon, who was King David's son, 
all three of these regions were part of ancient Israel. However, King Solomon gave some of the cities of Galilee to a foreign king. So a foreign influence, culture, and people were openly allowed into Galilee from that point. Now, after the reign of King Solomon, the nation of Israel was actually split into two separate kingdoms. The northern kingdom contained the regions of Galilee and Samaria, and the southern kingdom was comprised of Judah, or in the Greek it is called Judea. In Judea, the capital remained Jerusalem, as it had been ever since the time of King David. In the regions of Galilee and Samaria, the capital eventually became the city of Samaria. The northern kingdom abandoned God and eventually was conquered by the Assyrians, who exiled much of the population. And this was to ensure that the culture, religion, and genetics of the people in Galilee and Samaria were thoroughly diluted as they intermixed with the people of Assyria. A little over 100 years later, Judea was conquered by the Babylonians, but the Babylonians had a different philosophy and occupation than did the Assyrians. The Babylonians didn't automatically try to exile and intermix the populations of the nations they conquered. However, after about 20 years of occupation, Babylon was actually forced to destroy Jerusalem and exile much of the Judean population because they just proved to be continuously rebellious. Seventy years later, Judea was repopulated under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, and with that they returned to their original obedience to God. But the people in Samaria, who had been forcibly intermixed with the Assyrians, were now following a different version of Judaism. And these differences were significant probably on the same scale as the differences between Judaism and Christianity today. Jews and Christians both proclaim to follow the same God with looking at the Old Testament, but Christians believe that Jesus is the Messiah and is God, as is described in the New Testament, while the Jews do not. And this, of course, makes all the difference. So up to Jesus' day, there were some very strong tensions between the group of true followers of God in Judea and those of the followers of God in Samaria. Now, Galilee was sort of a mix of Samaria and Judea. Galilee had a similar history of Samaria. There was a totally intermixed population as a result of the Assyrian captivity. But unlike Samaria, Galilee continued to follow the one true God, just like the people of Judea. You can almost think of this as a sort of a social hierarchy from the perspective of the Jews living in Judea. There was the pure lineage and pure religion Jews who lived in Judea. Below them in this hierarchy were the mixed lineage, but still pure religion Jews in Galilee. And then below them in the hierarchy at the very bottom were the mixed lineage and mixed religion Samaritans. Now, Jesus was born in Judea, but if you remember from the Christmas story, his family fled to Egypt for fear of King Herod killing him. They then returned from Egypt to Galilee, which is where Jesus' father Joseph had been living before he married Mary. So although Jesus was from this pure lineage of Judea, he had actually been raised in an environment that, while still being true to God, was still generally considered lesser than in that region in Galilee. So in our passage today, Jesus was traveling from Judea to Galilee, but passing through Samaria. And you will understand why all of this is important in just a few minutes. But let's continue in John 4, verse 5. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So Jesus was in a town in Samaria called Sychar. And as he was going into that town, he decided to sit down by the well to rest this was a well that was actually dug by Jacob, and he sat there while his disciples went into the town to get some food. Now, 
At about noon, a woman came up to this well to draw some water. And when she arrived, Jesus asked her if she could give him a drink. Now, there's a lot of speculation about, made about why this woman was actually drawing water at noon. You see, noon was the heat of the day. It wasn't the normal time that somebody would come to draw water from a well. Now, it was normal for a woman to be drawing water, but usually that work was done in the mornings or in the evenings. But the text doesn't really explain why exactly she was there at this particular time. But what we do know is that it was abnormal for her to be there during that time of the day. So here's Jesus, presumably alone with this woman, asking her for water. Continuing in verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So this woman was pointing out to Jesus that not only was it unseemly for a rabbi to be speaking alone with a woman in public, but also that he was speaking and drinking from a vessel that a Samaritan had actually given him. Because Samaritans were considered unclean, so anything that they touched would become unclean. And then if a Jew was trying to be clean and pure was to drink from that thing, they too would become unclean. Continuing in verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So Jesus answers her question by telling her that if she only knew who he was, she would be asking him for the gift that he has to offer, which he is calling living water. But the woman is confused by this. She doesn't understand how he could possibly be getting water because he doesn't have anything to draw that water out with. But Jesus is not dissuaded by her question. Instead, he simply tells her that the water that he will give her will make her never thirsty again. It would well up inside her and give her eternal life. Well, what does he mean by living water? Well, in Jeremiah 17, 13, it says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. For they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Living water is imagery of none other than God himself. So Jesus is saying that those who receive this living water that he gives them will have it well up inside them to eternal life. In a symbolic fashion, he is really talking about receiving God, receiving salvation. Now this woman, maybe she was being a little bit sarcastic here, but she ends up asking Jesus for this water just so she doesn't have to get thirsty anymore. But rather than Jesus directly answering her obvious misunderstanding about what he's saying, he responds in verse 16. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is in the place where people ought to worship. So Jesus tells this woman to go and get her husband. But then, after she responds that she has no husband, Jesus is able to accurately tell her that she's right. She's actually had five husbands, and the one she's living with now isn't even her husband. 
Now, a single divorce was definitely not favored in Jesus' day, but five divorces would have been considered disgraceful. And for that reason, many would have considered, especially faithful Jews, would have considered this woman to be very immoral. And it's for this reason that many people will speculate that that is why she was drawing water at noon, because perhaps she was a social outcast because of her immorality. But that's actually not stated in the text. And for reasons that we'll get to later, I don't think it's actually correct. Regardless, this statement is clearly the turning point in their conversation, because there's no other way that Jesus could have known about her former marriages. So now she is very interested to hear what he has to say. So she turns to a theological point, a theological difference between that of the Samaritans and the Jews. She asks him, what's the proper place to worship? At a mountain in Samaria, at the temple there, or at the temple in Jerusalem? And then Jesus responds in verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So Jesus is saying that the time is coming and is in fact here already when locations of worship will no longer be relevant. All that matters for a true worshiper of God is to worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, what is the worship of God in spirit and in truth? Because Jesus says that this is important. This is what a true worshiper of God must be doing. So clearly this must be important for us to understand as well. Now the word spirit can actually be understood in several different ways as we are reading it in verses 23 and 24. It describes the way of worshiping. We are to worship in spirit. But it's also talking about who God is. God is spirit. It is his core essence. And again, these are coming from the same Greek word. And I think the best way for us to understand what worship in spirit means is that it means that the core essence of us, our spirit, must worship God and his spirit. The core essence of us must worship the core essence of him, all that we are. And Jesus actually talks about this when he's asked about the greatest commandment. And he says this in Matthew 22, starting in verse 37. And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. You must love God with all you are. This is the worship of God in spirit. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples, and he responds to something Thomas says in John 14, verses 6 and 7. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So not only is Jesus identifying himself with being the truth here, but he's also equating himself with being the Father. By seeing and knowing Jesus, we have seen and known the Father. So the worship of God in truth is the worship of God as he truly is. And this is why the Samaritans weren't actually worshiping God in truth, because they didn't have a proper understanding of who God is. We must know who he is. It it just can't be us making up who God is in our minds. We must worship him in truth. So the worship of God in spirit and in truth is us worshiping him with our whole being, our whole essence, our whole spirit, and worshiping him as he truly is. Continuing in John 4, verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I, who speak to you, am he. So this woman had already recognized that Jesus was a prophet. 
But they were talking about some very deep and very theologically complex things here. But the Samaritans and the Jews were both looking forward to the day when the Messiah would come. And in her mind, the Messiah was going to clear up all the misunderstandings between the Jews and the Samaritans. All of these weird theological questions would be made perfectly clear. But then Jesus responds to her in no unclear terms, saying that he is indeed the Messiah. Continuing in verse 27. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. So Jesus' disciples returned from getting some food, and when they were arrived, they were surprised to see that Jesus was talking with a woman. Now, perhaps wisely, they didn't challenge either Jesus or her on the fact that they were talking. But no sooner had they arrived than this woman ran off into town and told everybody that she knew about Jesus and about how she thought that he may very well be the Messiah. And apparently her words had some real sway because the people pretty much immediately came out of town to go and see Jesus for themselves. But while all this is going on, Jesus has this conversation with his disciples and we read about it continuing in verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his works. So having just purchased food, the disciples offered Jesus some of that food, but he responds to them by saying that he has food that they know nothing about. And they're a little bit confused by this. They wonder, well, did maybe somebody just give him some food while we are gone? But Jesus simply says that his food is to do the will of God and to accomplish his Father's work. What does Jesus mean by this? Well, essentially he is saying that his nourishment, his source of strength, his ability to continue in life is coming from being obedient to his Father. And Jesus actually says this in Matthew 4.4. 4. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. While our bodies are obviously requiring food for us to live, our nourishment must also come from devouring the word of God and being obedient to it. So taking a step back for a moment here. Jesus told this woman, this Samaritan, who is not a true believer, that to become a believer, she must receive living water. She must receive God for her to have salvation. And then he told his disciples that they must consume this food, this nourishment, which is ultimately the obedience to God, following and doing his will. And so too, we must consume the living water, God, to receive salvation. And then we must consume and digest the food, our nourishment, to be obedient to God's will. Continuing in John 4, verse 35. Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So in what seems to be a change of subjects here, Jesus shares with them a proverb of the day. And the proverb is, is that there are still four months until the harvest which essentially means that you can't rush the harvest. You have to wait between sowing and reaping. But in this case, Jesus is telling them, look, the fields are already ripe for the harvest. We don't need to wait. We can go and reap the harvest right now. 
Whoever is reaping is benefiting from that harvest at this point in time. And while it may be true that whoever sows is not going to be the same person who reaps, that is definitely true in this particular case because there is that harvest, a harvest that was not labored for, was not sown by the disciples. So they can benefit from taking advantage of taking in this harvest right now. They are spared all that extra labor. And Jesus was telling them this, coming right off of this total change in heart and mind of this Samaritan woman who had seemingly now received salvation. Jesus is telling them that the harvest is plentiful and ready right now. Not just in Samaria, which was definitely the case, but really everywhere. All that was needed was laborers to reap the harvest. And we are some of those laborers today. Being laborers in the harvest is part of being obedient to God. This is our nourishment. We need this for us to live. Without it, we will die. If not physically, we will die spiritually. Continuing in verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So the text indicates that while Jesus was having this discussion with his disciples, not only did a bunch of people from the village go to see Jesus because of what this Samaritan woman had shared, but many of these people actually believed Jesus was the Messiah simply because of her words. And it's for this reason, I don't think that this woman was a social outcast. Social outcasts don't typically have this type of sway with people. They can't go into town and tell people that the Messiah is here and people will automatically believe them. Now, of course, many prophets were indeed social outcasts, but they were living the opposite of immoral lives. They were living very pure lives, very dedicated lives. And even though they were social outcasts, they were still respected because of how they were devoted to God. This woman, though, was not in that category. It was clear that she was not the most upstanding of individuals, yet she had this kind of sway. And the text tells us that many people believed her. They then invited Jesus to come and stay with them in their town, and their beliefs were either strengthened or entirely believed in Jesus now that they were in contact with him for themselves. And eventually, their proclamation was that Jesus was indeed the Savior of the world. So this woman had actually received the living water. She had received salvation from Jesus. And then without her really maybe even realizing it, she consumed the food of God. She was obedient. She went out and shared the gospel, actually sowing the harvest so that it was ready for the disciples. They didn't have to do any hard labor. But by the time the Samaritans were coming to them and to Jesus, that harvest was ripe and ready to be reaped. The fact of the matter is that there is a harvest all around us today, a harvest that is ready, that is ripe, and we are the laborers. All we have to do is step out and take advantage of the hard work that has already been done for us as well. So there are four main takeaways that I want us to pull out of our text this morning. The first takeaway is that everyone must consume the living water. They must believe in and follow God. The second takeaway is that everyone must be nourished by the food of his word. They must learn it and be obedient to it. The third takeaway is that obedience involves, among other things, being a laborer of the harvest that is all around us. And the fourth takeaway is that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. So let's talk about these things in some more detail with our discussion questions for this morning. The first question, what are some indicators that a person is worshiping God in spirit with their whole being? Question number two, 
What are some things that the Bible tells us that we should be doing in obedience to God? Please provide some examples from Scripture. Question number three. Do you feel like there is a ripe harvest around us? Why or why not? Question number four. What are the actions of someone who sows for the harvest compared to someone who reaps the harvest? Do you feel more like a sower, a reaper, or neither of these, and why? Question number five. What steps can a Christian take to become more like a reaper of the harvest? Please pause, take five or ten minutes to discuss these questions with members of your household, and then you can continue with the service after that. Please join me in prayer. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come together and, and learn more about you. We just ask that the truths that we have learned about today, that we have discussed today, would penetrate our hearts, Lord, that they would change us, make us more like you. And God, I just pray that as we are looking to the weeks ahead, Lord, that you would keep us healthy. You would help us to minister to those around us who are hurting, who are lost, who are discouraged, especially in light of our current situation. God, we just pray for this community. Help it to come to know you, that revival would truly take place in this land. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for worship here at Community Alliance Church. Please stay tuned for the fellowship hour at noon. And remember, you were made to walk with Christ in days such as these. God bless.